Welcome to Investor in the Family Radio, a podcast about learning to invest. My name is Brian Bain, and I'm your host. At Investor in the Family Radio, we believe that every dollar and minute we spend is an investment in something, and together, we want to make the best investments that we can, so thank you so much for joining us. And on today's show, we have Robert Hover from Double Dividend Stocks. We're going to sit down and learn more, learn more about his approach to trading options, and we're going to talk about the core concepts behind his company, Double Dividend Stocks, and their approach to investing in dividend companies. And is it possible to manufacture a double dividend where it does not already exist. We're talking about the fact that Warren Buffett is actually a big option seller. Not many people may know that. We're going to discuss how and when to use cash secured puts, how and when to use covered calls, and why the put the space between strike and price, strike price and stock price, what you should aim for, when to sell leaps, and is it best to buy or sell options, and all kinds of stuff like that. So it's going to be a great time with Robert today. Also, a new feature on the show I've mentioned before, if you're not able to take notes while listening or if you're listening while working out or driving and you think, oh, I, I missed some content that I want later on, and you'd like a summary sheet of show highlights, I can send those to you. This is not a simply a preview sheet, but actual my notes that I take during the interview with all the key ideas. If you want these notes, simply text the word, one word, family notes as one word, family notes to the number 44222 or visit investorinthefamily.com and sign up and we'll be sure to get you taken care of there as well. Remember, our goal is to help you learn to invest financially and in all of life. You can always find more at investorinthefamily.com or subscribe to the podcast at iTunes or the Google Play Store. How much time do you currently spend trying to figure out your investments? Are you tired of spinning your wheels, attempting to conduct research that you really don't have time for? And if we're honest, you might not actually be qualified to do. Brett Jensen is the man behind the Biotech Forum, the number two premium marketplace service on Seeking Alpha. He's also a top 5% ranked analyst according to Tip Ranks. Do you like owning companies that get acquired? So does Brett. Are you anxious about the current election season and how it may impact your portfolio? Perhaps it's time you put a portion of your portfolio on autopilot with Brett as your guide. Visit biotechforumsa.com for more information. That's biotechforumsa.com. SA as in Seeking Alpha, biotechforumsa.com. And I hope you enjoy today's show with Robert Hover. Well, hey, Robert, welcome to the show. Ah, great to be here. Well, we're honored to have you with us, and I'd love if we could get started. Do you mind sharing with our audience a little bit about who you are and what you're doing in the investing space? Sure. I have an MBA, and I spent 20-plus uh, years in the food business doing various financial and marketing work. I was in a wild section of the food business. We were exotic produce importers who flew in 95% of our produce from all various corners of the earth. Wow. And, uh, it was, it was, it was really interesting. We rode the trajectory upwards of the food revolution and helped in our small way to, to teach America how to eat. And, uh, the, the, the man who started the company was uh, fluent in all these languages and travel the globe and set up deals and we'd fly in all this stuff. And, you know, with small business, you get to wear a lot of hats. So yeah. with my I'm MBA, picturing I Panama to... Jack at the moment, just for the record. I'm sorry. I'm picturing Panama Jack in my mind as you're describing your business. Well, well picture raspberries in January. Okay. Or picture instead of uh, instead of uh, green asparagus, figure picture white asparagus. Interesting. Um, things like like that. It was either um, counter seasonal or uh, oh, they were wow. small, okay. like baby vegetables, things like that. So, uh, I, so that's I, what you I, mean I by that. that's what you mean by exotic foods. Okay. Exactly right, and uh, it was all perishables and. Uh, Highly remunerative. I eventually became a partner and uh, was lucky enough to do that for about 20 years. And then I eventually um, sold out my shares and retired at the age of 50. And uh, then I'm also an investment advisor rep with uh, uh, ANS Capital Management. Uh, my my partner in the website, Robert Sluice, runs ANS, and he's been doing portfolio management for over 25 years. So. I, you know, the good news is I retired at at 50. The bad news is then the crash came in the fall of 2008. Oh, man. So, you know, October 10th, 2008 is a, a date I'll never forget. It was like rats jumping off a ship. They were selling everything, you know, willy nilly. Nobody knew who would maintain their dividends, who would cut and slash them, and so on. I was fortunate enough to be in a position to buy some stocks that were yielding 20% and they never cut their dividends. But I started thinking about it as the market progressed through those months. I said, well, gee, you know, I'm doing all this research. Maybe I can help some other people. So, you know, sometimes in life you get lucky. So I started uh, Double Dividend Stocks the week of March the 6th, 2009. 
at the market <laughs> bottom, right? <laughs> nice. Do you remember what? The, Let me know the next price. time is you start a business. Pardon me. Let me know when the next time is you start a business, and I'll. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> so guess guess what the uh, if you're into numerology, guess what the the uh, price of the S and P was at the bottom. Was Any six idea? six six, wasn't it? Yeah, six six six. I'm, yeah. I'm like, you know, I'm waving a head of garlic, and I got an iron cross now. Just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it went up from there, so that's good. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, over two hundred percent. So, you know, when I was developing the site, there were so many dividend slashes for for about thirty seconds. I was thinking I would call it the, call the site, you know, dividend death investor. You know, which I don't know if that would have gone over. It would have been like you know Macbeth the musical or something. But uh, <laughs> I eventually ended up with double dividend stocks, and it was a simple concept. Since all these corporations were cutting dividends and you know, nobody could depend upon them, well, why couldn't you manufacture a dividend that these guys couldn't cut by selling options? So back in those days. <clears throat> The, the options, uh, the idea of options, you know, they were sort of mainstream, but nothing like today, thanks to a lot of different websites like mine where hundreds and hundreds of articles have come about about you know selling options. Back in those days, I talk, start talking about options to people, and they'd start twitching. You know, uh, basically, they were right, and there's a reason for that. that everybody had lost money, or most people, most you know, retail traders, and there's, and there's one reason. 75% of all options expire worthless. So that's what you want, though, as an option seller. So that's what I started to promote. And now people, basically, they use our site in three different ways. They either uh, they buy and they hold the uh, the equities for dividend income because they're all based on you know really good blue-chip uh, uh, dividend-paying stocks, or they sell covered calls to goose their returns, or if the market's on fire and, it, and an equity is right at the edge of where we think it should be uh, bought, they might sell puts beneath the price and basically to get a cheaper cost and, and to get paid to wait. A lot of people don't realize Warren Buffett is a big options trader. He has a division in his company. Now, Warren Buffett has the wherewithal, though, to go and sell options that are like seven years out. So he'll get paid millions upon millions of dollars to do that and use that money uh, that's tax deferred, which is one of the um, nice little benefits that uh, us little guys have in the world of options. The other thing that people like is that they can quantify the gains before they trade. So if you have a, a stock that you like, you, you want to buy it, you sell a covered call at the next price strike or you know maybe a few price strikes above the stock, you know what you're going to get as a premium before you even make, even make the trade. So that's, that's the upside of it. And the idea is, okay, compare that um, to the dividend that's going to uh, go X before the expiration date. And that's why on those tables on our website, you'll see the column and it'll say pre-expiration date dividends, and then it'll say the call bid premium so that people can compare the two. And they're all done with annualized yields and so on. Okay, I, yeah, I want to talk about this methodology a little bit because I'm always... I don't do a lot of option selling, <clears throat> and so right. I. But I've had a number of guests who do, and every time I talk to them, if the idea fascinates me because it's, it's if done well, oftentimes you can win on multiple sides of the equation. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me, so I want to hear more about your strategy. You talk primarily you're selling you're selling call options. It sounds like, but in some rare scenarios, maybe a, you're selling puts. Well, actually, um, what we do is when we put out a monthly issue. We'll put out certain um, stocks that we'll recommend, and we'll we'll do a cash secured put um, recommendation for each, and a covered call recommendation for each, unless it's a stock who's run up in value so much and price so much. We still believe in the story, but you know we want to pussyfoot into it at a lower cost, right? And that's when the cash secured puts will come in. Sometimes we'll just say, hey, we believe in this story. It's great, but we don't want to pay at the top. And we have no way of knowing you know, if, uh, how it's going to go. So let's be more conservative. And we deem cash secured puts as our most conservative strategy. And let's sell, let's sell um, puts you know, out of the money. So the other thing that we talk to people about, our subscribers about a lot, is try to do this on down days. You know, we basically 
look at buying stocks like you know buying a pair of shoes. I mean, you, you couldn't imagine like listening to a like a TV commercial. Hey, you know we're selling these loafers for the highest price in years. Come on down and scoop some up. <laughs> You're not going to go down to that store, you know. So basically, we're looking for to buy things when they're on sale. So if you're going to sell cash secure puts, look for a down day, and look also look for more um, uh, bidders or buyers than sellers. And the down day will create some desperation in the buyers' side, right? And especially if you got more buyers than option sellers, you'll be able to get a better uh, price than you see on our tables. All our tables are based on the bid. So that's the worst case scenario. So in general, when we go and we sell puts or calls, we'll be somewhere, you know, in the, between the bid and the ask. And you've got a much better chance of doing that if, uh, the market looks lousy that day and, and the stock is down, for example. Okay. Let me, let me do this because I want to make sure, because sometimes, like you mentioned, there are a lot of people who don't have a lot of experience with options. And so some people, everything you're saying makes perfect sense, but I want to drill down on a few different questions just to clarify. Sure. So again, when you say cash secured put, that means you are, if you're selling a cash secured put, you, that means, you are selling the put, you're writing it, and someone else is buying it from you. And cash secured means that you have basically, if you get called on that, you have the money cash in your account to to um, to exercise that option. Basically, that's right. There's and there's various levels of uh, of option trading that you have to qualify with your broker. So options level two to three, that's when it gets rather interesting because then. You only have to, they're only going to hold about 35% of the money as opposed to option level one where you, or, or two rather, where they're going to hold 100% of it. So in an IRA, they're always going to hold 100% for, for good reason, right? You know, IRAs are not for gambling. Uh, not that this is total gambling, but it's a little <laughs> more speculative. Right. You know? Nice catch. Um, now that being said, so, okay, so now suddenly they're only holding 35%. So then you're working with leverage. So then the percentages when things are going well is, you know, looking peachy keen. When things are not going so well, like, like a year ago, you know, when the Chinese went off the deep end with their devaluation, then, you know, it can be very scary if, if you've got, you know, a lot of those positions, those cash secured positions going. So what I, we always tell people is to, uh, get yourself a spreadsheet going. So that you can see what your total exposure is if you have those stocks get put to you. And that's one other bottom line. Try not to ever sell puts against a stock that you don't want to own. Mm-hmm. You have to really, you know, psychically be or psychologically being willing to own that stock before you do it. Yeah. One of, one of the, the neatest strategies that I've heard, and I'm, it's not revolutionary, but, um, was one of the people, the gentleman that I had on my show, he just, he, he was, he had a system that he had a lot of confidence in, in terms of determining price targets and what he determined. He identified a company he wanted. He determined what he thought a good buy price was and he sold, um, sold puts on that. And so he knew that he, he, he got the premium and was totally fine. He kind of wanted the stock to get put to him at that price. And then right. he had a, a, sell, a price target he wanted to sell at and he did the same thing with selling call options up there. Um, and I thought that's so basic. Of course, it, it requires having a methodology and that you have confidence yeah. in, obviously, in ter- determining buy prices and sell prices. But if you have that, man, mm-hmm. what a great way to, to boost your yield. And that may be very similar to what you guys are doing. Well, sure. I mean, if you look at any of the market, you know, bottoms and so on, like last mid October, um, also February 12th, when oil bottomed and the market started taking off this year, you know, that's in a perfect world. That's when you'd be selling, you know, sure. a lot of cash secured puts. So the good news there is, you know, you're getting great premiums and so on. The bad news is that you're basically, you're standing on the dock with your little pail of cash and the big boat sails away. And you, you know, you keep, get to keep that little pail of cash, but you don't get to, you know, go on the big ship when it sails off into the horizon. In right, other right. words, you know, that metaphor means that you might make, uh, 20%, but, you know, you're not going to make 50%. Right. You know? Whereas someone might have if they'd actually owned the company and wrote it back up. That's right. So then that leads me to covered calls. Okay. So when is it best to, to be doing covered calls? Really in a sideways market. Or in a market where a uh, period of time where you think the market's going to go south, you know, i.e., right now, September, October, they're always the worst months of, of the year 
you know, historically speaking. So that that can be a pretty reasonable time to to think, well, yeah, I want to get some protection. So instead of buying puts, I want to be on the other side. Um, and that that also leads me to the philosophy of, okay, I, th- I believe in this this company. I think I'll just buy you know, I'll buy some calls. Well, why not sell some puts instead? If you have the wherewithal to do it, right? Because right. just to be clear, because selling puts is bullish. You know, a lot of times, people may think that's right. Put is negative. And it put takes a while to yeah. to um, intuit it. You right. know, you got to be able to to think bass backwards, basically. Because right. you know? yeah, so you've got buying a call option is bullish, selling a put option is bullish. That's correct. Buying a put option is bearish, and selling right. a call option is bearish. Right. And so, with a covered call, what's going on there? Why why is it why is it what's it covered by? What does that mean? Okay, so for example, say you have a you have a stock that you believe in, but uh, eh, the dividend's okay, but you know you'd like to goose it a little bit more. So you you take a look at the the covered call premium, see what you can get, you compare it to that dividend. That being said, it can be um, you know relatively short term thinking, um, because if that stock takes off, well then you got to look for something to replace it, right? But there are people. Um, that are looking for income, you know, every every month, right? And so this is one one strategy that they can employ to basically get that uh, to augment their their uh, dividend income. So let's say I'm just going to randomly pick a company. Let's say I own Boeing or something like that, and mm-hmm. it's paying a dividend. I like the company, and so if I do a covered call, that means I'm selling, I'm writing or selling a call option on a company, and it's covered, meaning I own that stock myself, right? That's right. Okay. Well, yeah. So, or or you can just go buy it. Okay. You know, for example. Okay. Um, here, let's take a stock like, uh, or uh, here, uh, Cummins, for example. If we look at our our call table on the website today, Cummins CMI is at one nineteen eleven. There's no dividend. I, I just have a like an October call on it. A one twenty call, which is you know just about out the money, is uh, two seventy. So basically, you know, you'd get 270 bucks for selling one contract. Each contract is uh, equal to 100 shares right. of the underlying and so on. Or looking at um, here, Digital Realty, it's a company we believe in, the cloud storage company. Yeah, they're selling for 96.46. They've got an 85 cent dividend it's going ex dividend sometime in the next uh, few weeks. The 100 October. Uh, near near term expiration is uh, ninety cents, so there it is. Ninety cents versus eighty five cents. You can double the dividend if the thing. And then if the thing gets called away before you you get paid your dividend, well, it's from ninety six forty six to a hundred. That's uh, three dollars and fifty four cents plus you you keep your call premium of ninety cents. So there's four forty four. And, and so if it gets called away and you again at the strike price of a hundred dollars, that means. Basically, you've you've got to give them or sell them that that you, digital realty, right. even if it went up to 120 bucks. You've got to sell it at 100 dollars, and so right. the risk there is a company does go up and you miss out on it. But that's again why you mentioned it's best in a sideways market. So hopefully, you know right. there aren't going to be any extreme moves up or down, and you can just enjoy the premium. Right. But so then you know suddenly digital announces some very beneficial announcement, and they they take off. So this is when looking at the relationship to the price per share to the strike price is important. You want to give yourself enough space between the strikes, strike price and the price per share at the time so that you're amply rewarded for losing that dividend, right? So and this is a good example because digital is only 96, let's say 9650 is $3.50 below the $100 strike price. So in order for that those shares to get called away, you know you're going to get 350 bucks for every contract. Mm, so right, that's a, you know, a nice piece of change. It's short term thinking, right? But, you know, that's that's uh, just another way to to approach you know, earning income. Well, that's an, yeah, that's another question I was going to have. So, do you mostly operate with options within a, basically a two month time frame, two to three months? Is that kind of your focus? Um, no, actually, if it's if if the market is um, has really gone south, and we see some compelling values, what we'll do is we'll sometimes sell what they call leaps, which is something mm-hmm. that's um, going to 
expire, say, in the next year or the year after. Here's an interesting little um, uh, beneficial tidbit for uh, selling leaps. It's one of the, the few um, nice little pluses that us little guys get. Say you sell now, you, you sell a, an option that's going to expire in 2017. If you don't um, close that trade and you just let it expire in 2017, well, the thing that's great, Brian, is that you get paid that money within three days. Often it'll hit your account the same day. But you get the tax-free use of that money until April 15th, 2018. So it's great for cash, uh, cash flow. And now, so picture a guy like Warren Buffett. He's selling these things, you know, seven years out and he's getting the use of millions of dollars, you know, tax deferred. So I would imagine he might find a way to use that money. Sure. So yeah, you've got, you've got, it's like a free loan almost. Yeah. It's one of the, you know, the nice freebies for us little guys. Well, so tell me more about like, so, you know, you mentioned Buffett selling these, these options and I've heard this before, you know, actually fairly recently. And obviously it's not something that you hear much about, but anyone you can look at Berkshire Hathaway annual reports. It's all very clearly ex- expressed, explained there how they're doing it and what they're doing. But how, you know, you, th- you think Warren Buffett, you think conservative, you think value investing, both those things are true right. and accurate. You think right. options, you don't ever think conservative. So what is about his methodology, and, and maybe it's the same with your work, that makes it feel, quote unquote, safe enough to do? Does that make sense? Okay. Well, sure. Yeah, you would think options, not conservative, because most people get fleeced in the options market because they're buying them, right? And right. The poor buyer. I mean, geez, not only does he have to get the direction of the stock correct uh, and, and the price correct, but he's got to do it at a certain time. So meanwhile, the clock is just ticking away. And guess what? I'm smiling on the other side because I want these things to expire worthless as a seller. Right. So what, why would you think it's conservative to do that? Well, here, here's why. Basically, you're creating another income stream that's knocking down your break-even. So it's giving you a lower break-even, and that's why we deem it to be more conservative. Is it short-term? Yeah, it's, it's more short-term thinking. But any time you could go, you know, knock down your break-even on something, to me, it, it seems like a, a simpler way to um, lower your uh, exposure. Yeah, I think one of the things that that gets scary with selling options is when I'm in my brokerage account and you're, you know, you're lining up all the information to either buy or sell an option. When you buy an option, at least in my brokerage, it'll say potential gain, potential loss. It'll say potential loss and it has the amount that you're putting out there and then potential gain right. unlimited. When you're selling a call or a put, it'll say potential gain is limited, but the potential loss is unlimited. And that, that alone makes you think, Oh man, that's really scary. What if, uh, what, if, yeah. what if the extreme happens, but reality, I mean, I guess, oh, okay. re- yeah. But you know what? The other thing, let me jump in there. So the, the, some of the brokerages, you know, they, they, the last thing you ever want to do or tell anybody to do is to sell a naked call. Okay. You know, you know that old phrase, um, you can lose more than your digni- dignity walking naked down Wall Street. <laughs> well, that's what it refers to. Okay. Basically, you always want to sell a covered call, i.e., you must own the stock before you sell a call. And it's very tantalizing. Like, if you think, you know, we're all going to be living in tents, in, you know, in two, two weeks and you're looking at the call options, and they're really fat and juicy. You might make, you know, 40% in two weeks and so on. Yeah, well, you know what? Don't do it uh, mm-hmm. unless you're, you know, a multi, multi, multi-millionaire because it's, it's the most risky thing you could do, basically. Yeah, You'd so be better it, off to go to the track on a sunny day. <laughs> um, you know, I, I really, I, I genuinely appreciate it when people compare investing to gambling because yeah. no one wants to do that. But I think it's, and I, I, I say this to our audience and myself, not to you. But it's, I think it's so important for us to acknowledge the reality of this because it doesn't, right. it shouldn't be gambling, but the way right. so many of us approach it, it really right. is gambling. And, and I, and I, I just, sure. one of the reasons I have this show and this business is to help protect all of us from making those big mistakes. And so I, I'm, I'm glad right. to hear you say that. Well, then the other thing that people need to understand is covered call writing or selling is a form of uh, portfolio insurance. It's a form of protection. Uh, professional money managers use covered calls extensively to uh, protect their, their clients' portfolios. 
So then people say, well, you know, gee, why don't they just buy puts? Well, they buy puts too, but they help themselves uh, the cost of buying those puts by selling some covered calls on the other side. And you just, so, to, just to be clear, the reason you said is you want to make sure you do a covered call instead of a naked call and – you want mm-hmm. to make sure you own the stock. So again, if, if I'm if I'm selling a call option on right. Boeing, one call contract, I want to make sure I've got a hundred shares of Boeing in my portfolio. Because when right. that's the case, you, you 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 there's no longer an unlimited loss because you exactly. if the company goes up a lot or whatever else, you don't have to go out and pay if if Boeing's what is it at one thirty if it goes up to one fifty or two hundred then some crazy extreme thing you don't have to go out and pay 200 for that stock because you already own it right exactly yeah. and not only are you, are, are you uh you know open to less loss you're you're actually mitigating your loss because you've got some more income going against it right and i guess right. the downside of covered call writing or selling is that if the co- the stock you do own does go up a lot you miss out you you, you gain right. that premium but you do miss out on that appreciation <laughs> That's right. So, in a rampant bull market, you know, the covered calls aren't aren't so great for certain stocks. You know, uh, like you know Tesla or some you know high flyer like that, or <laughs> right. one of the biotechs. It wouldn't have been a real uh, savvy move, right, to to sell a covered call and something like that, unless you basically want to you know uh, optimize a, a short term gain. Do you typically no. focus on being like just in the money or just out of the money? Do you ever do any really extreme out of the money? Well, options? that all depends on the level of market volatility. Okay. So as volatility uh, gets extreme, it's a nice gift to option sellers because they can go further away from the money and have a bigger uh, pad between their price per share and the, the strike price. And then, as as and the other uh, flip side of that coin is, as the volatility declines, then you can you know you find yourself nearer the uh, actual price per share. And then you know, every uh, every stock is different. There there not every stock has options either. And right. then some stocks are very thinly traded, and those you got to watch out for too because you might want to get out of the position for whatever reason. And then there's just too big of a bid ask uh, spread. On them, basically. so that's helpful, and I want to come back to that but too. But so we mentioned with covered calls, that's the way to sell a call option and basically and and, and protect yourself from exactly. the unlimited loss. Is there an equivalent? And and you said you always want to do cash secured puts, but mm-hmm. technically, and I guess a company can only fall by so much. It can't. It can. It can't go past zero. Um, I guess is that the inherent insurance or protection in selling put options, right. or is there something else you can do to protect yourself? Well, on the flip side, so say you want to, you know, enter into uh, a company into a position, right? So I'm I'm pulling up our cash secured puts table here. Um, well, let's look at uh, here uh, Schlumberger, you know, the biggest oil services company in the in the world. It's trading at a little over seventy nine. Um, well, it's fifty two week high is eighty four, eighty three ninety seven. So maybe you think that's a little too rich. So there's a put strike at seventy seven fifty. You get paid two dollars and eleven cents for it. So now you break even seventy five thirty nine. You're still, you know, way above fifty nine sixty. It's week it's fifty two week low. But our our table shows you your break even price right next to the fifty two week low. So you can kind of see where the stock's been and what the trade would uh you know, would would do for you vis a vis that uh, that fifty two week low. So the the benefit is you kind of you assume um, that it, it probably will with, remain within the the fifty two week trading range from in most cases, especially with a company like this one. Um, and so in that sense, you can have an idea of what is the most likely highest downside that you'll face. Again, there's always exceptions. Um, right. Is that that's kind of the general idea? Yeah, that's the idea, and we. Um, we never ever advise selling uh, puts above the company's price per share. Many uh, institutional investors will do that, and, and so on. But it's a really risky way to go about it. You know, the, our approach to selling using the puts is to get yourself uh, a lower break-even. You know, plain and simple. So it, you want to try to go as low as you can. When I guess one of the ways this is also protect, there is some inherent protection is like you said, you never should sell puts on a company that you don't want to own. And base, and I guess 
Right. Uh, it'd be fair to say never sell puts on a company you don't want to own at a price that you're not okay buying it at. Because like I said, right. with, with, so if you're okay buying, I, mm-hmm. for some reason, I keep going back to Boeing, it's just in my head. If you're okay buying Boeing at one 120, then you have no problem selling puts at 120. As long as you're right, okay with right, that. Right, right now, Boeing is trading at 130.50 today. Right. On our cash secured puts table, we've got a November expiration. 125 is the strike price. Gotcha. You get 355. So your break even is 121.45 uh, versus a 52 week low of 102. Hey, you're still 20% above, but hey, you know, you're, you're, uh, you know, 355 plus five. Yeah, you're like 9% below what you, you'd have as a break even if you just bought the stock so so that's like you know you're, you're it's kind of like agnostic uh thinking you sort of sort of kind of you know um want to own it but you don't want to own it at this price it's too expensive yeah well, well unfortunately the wrap up here in just a minute but i so it sounds like if you ever want to buy a company then it makes sense to sell sell cash covered puts at a price you want it and just wait. And if he doesn't, if you don't get it, then just, I mean, do you ever buy stock having not sold cash secured puts in advance? I know there's obviously some exceptions, but generally speaking, would that be the general approach that you take? Yeah, it's, it's just the one of, uh, That's great. three ways to, you know, get involved. You either just buy the companies and, and, um, hold them for income. And we, we do a lot of, um, research. For the company, so we're not going to get involved with any high flyers or you know fly by night companies, so that a, you know an investor can just basically look at the stock and say, well, I don't want to mess with all this option stuff. I don't have the time. We're just going to buy it and hold it for income. Right. Or then you can finesse that. Or it's it, you know I'm a little bit bearish now, but I like the company. Eh, let's sell some you know let's sell, sell some puts below it, uh, particularly you know on a on a down day. But uh, we look at the fundamentals. We we also look at uh, technical things and so on. And it's a little bit different, you know, with our not different, but it's 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 more expanded um, depending on what the, the stock is. But you know, when when we write on uh, seeking alpha, the first thing we always talk about is are these guys covering their dividend or not, and how are they doing it? Is it DCF, FFO? Um, and, you know, or adjusted EPS. And is it easy to understand their non-GAAP metrics or is it like herding a bunch of cats? You know, there's companies <laughs> right. that I just, you know, I started researching them and like, you know, 12, 12 hours later, I really need a cold drink. Because right. It's just impossible to understand what they're doing. You know, right. there's so much chicanery involved. So, uh, you know, I'll, I look at uh, a lot of uh, uh, articles that, uh, on Seeking Alpha to see, if a certain company interests me as an investor and so on. And if I, you know, quite frankly, if I don't see some kind of uh, easy to understand or legible type of uh, explanation, then it's just going to pass it. That's one of the reasons we use a lot of infographics. It's just so much more efficient and timely. You can sure. understand what we're trying to put across in a tenth of a second. Yeah. Well, Robert, I appreciate this. This has been, I've thoroughly enjoyed just, uh, you know, some new ideas, but also just, just kind of getting a lot more clarity in terms of option strategies and how to use them, how you guys use them. And so I appreciate you giving us this time today and encourage everyone to check out double dividend stocks.com. I've been looking at it as we've been talking on this interview and there are a lot, a lot of really helpful resources there as well. But, um, Robert, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was a pleasure. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll come back and do son of double dividend stocks.com. <laughs> I'll look forward to it. All right. Take care. Well, hope you enjoyed today's show with Robert Hover. Remember, you can get full show notes with links and other details at investorinthefamily.com. And you can always subscribe to the show at iTunes, Stitcher, or the Google Play Store if interested. And if you want to receive my summary sheet highlights, all the big things from the show on one piece of paper, simply text the word, one word, family notes, one word, family notes to the number 44222, or visit investorinthefamily.com and sign up. We'll be sure to get you taken care of. This is Brian, and thanks for joining the family. The information and opinions contained on this podcast are for educational purposes only. The information does not consider the economic status or risk profile of any specific person. The information and opinions expressed should not be construed as investment trading advice and does not constitute an offer or an invitation to make an offer to buy and sell securities. 